We are in lecture four. Um, I know I said I was going to have a lab one graded by today, but I uh, just got caught up with stuff. I think I'll have it graded by the end of the week. Um, what I will probably do, because I've got uh, uh, labs that are, um, so, you know, like multiple students, uh, you know, would contribute to the same submissions. I'll probably do some sort of automated reporting uh, where I'll, like, send you an email that basically says, uh, here's, you know, your performance on the lab. Uh, for the most part, the last lab, like, I think pretty much everybody's going to um, do, like, like, grades aren't really going to be too much of a concern. The only thing I'm looking at on the first lab is the scale distances on the first one. I want to check and make sure those are right. Uh, but for the most part, all the, like, fill-in questions, I, I don't really think there were too many issues there. Um, so homework one is due today, and um, I decided that I'm not going to assign a homework this week. Um, the reason why is because I was looking at the homework that I would assign, and it is just really, really short, and I don't really see a need to do that right now. Instead, I'll just wait until we do leveling. Um, of the problems that I was going to ask on that assignment, I was looking at it last night. I think a couple of them I probably just decided I'm not going to worry about. And then of the remaining ones, um, I could just append those to the, um, to the homework we're about to do because they're really short. And so might as well just, just uh, wait on that. Um, so no homework uh, this weekend. Um, so unless you want one, I'll make one. No, we good. Um, we good. Uh, yeah, oh, we good. oh, so now we get the, the vocality from the class. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the other thing I'll mention is that, so I, you know, it's, it's my first time teaching the class in about 10 years, and um, I'm looking through how I, I want to do the class. And so one of the things I want to do uh, with this course is I want to try and make the labs as self-contained as possible. So some of those labs, I don't think it's going to be possible to do that. So a good example of that is the topo. We're going to have to collect the topo data in one week, and then we're going to have to um, draw that up the following week. Like, we can't just do it in one week. But for, th for this lab, for the lab that's today and tomorrow, I'm going to try and set it up to where you do the, uh, as many of the labs as possible in lab. So you do the lab in lab, submit it in lab, and so there's not as much outstanding work outside of class. Because I'm going to try and, what, I, what I'm ultimately trying to do is reduce the amount of overlap. Like it's not a matter of not uh, you know, getting work or anything, but I, I'm going to try and avoid the, okay, you've got homework due this day and then a lab report due this day. I want to try and make it so that as much as possible, you're working on one thing at a time. When you have a class that has a lab, sometimes that's kind of difficult. But I'm going to try and do my best on that. So the lab today uh, and tomorrow, for those of you that are in the Thursday session, is a lab that you'll do in lab. You'll do the lab, submit the lab, and then you don't have to worry about it. So, sound good? Ew. Okay. All right. And my apologies for the um, the, the confusion regarding the um, the um, the uh, subscripts on that error. I, I was looking at an old textbook, and the textbook had a typo. And I think in the middle of class, I just went with the one, and I should have went with the other. So, whoops. But um, we'll add... You know, we'll, we'll go 0.6 on the seven mistake counter. Um, one final question before we move on. How, other than that, how did the homework go? Was it pretty straightforward? Um, the trig. I got a lot of questions on the trig. I just want to make sure the trig was something you were comfortable with. Everybody good with that? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Today's lecture will be a little looser. Like, it won't be as heavy on the tech and formula side. It's more just some discussion and getting your thoughts wrapped around um, some, of the, um, uh, some of the topics of the course. So um, today's lecture is on horizontal distance measurement, okay? And I just want to ask you a couple questions, um, just, just get your thoughts thinking about this. So I have here an aerial map uh, image that I pulled. This is from Google Maps. And I've got here um, two stars on the map, okay? So this one over here, well, first off, y'all should recognize this. This is Marshall, right? This is Marshall's campus, okay? So this right here is the entrance to home. This is the engineering building, and this is the entrance to the science building, right? So this is your favorite building. This is your second favorite building. Um, that was a joke, not a very funny one. Apparently not, so. Did I touch a nerve? <laughs> <laughs> I love my job. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just curious. Um, let's just ask some questions before before we get into our topics. What if I wanted to measure the distance from there to there? What are some methods that you could use to do that? Eyeball. 
That uh, hold on. You said eyeball it. That's an answer. That is an actual answer. Now let's talk about that. So um, visual estimation of some distances is a means of estimating distances, and it is also a method that is actually used even to this day. That's not to say we're going to you know put that you know down as the final be all end all distance. But as an example, if um, you're trying to locate property corners on a site and you know the property corner should be 150 feet from point A to point B and you're standing on point A, you could say it's probably about there, you know, and at least that will give you some guidance on locating it. Again, it's not the be all end all and there is inaccuracy with that method, but that is a method, okay? What about another method? What's that? Pull a chain. Or Pulling something. a chain, yes. And and we haven't gotten into discussing uh, 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 pulling chains in the class, so, um, but we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. But suffice it to say, so using a survey chain is one of a, a more older means of classifying uh, or of measuring distances. Um, and so if, you know, for example, uh, a chain is, you know, about 66 feet long, um, if you look at 10 square chains, that's an anchor. Wondering where these weird units come from. Well, there you go. Um, what about uh, what's some other means of measuring that distance? Satellite. Oh, satellite. So um, uh, essentially, the Google Maps answer. Just scale it on Google Maps. That's an answer. That's an that's an answer. What about something else. Hold on. Hold on. Rangefinder. A rangefinder. You could use that, right? You could do that. Um, there are some methods which you. Uh, which some of you, if you, I, I, I was talking to some students um, uh, uh, before uh, class day, and I, I think that there's some of you that might have a little bit of experience with land surveying, so using some of the devices that we're going to learn in here, like an auto level or a total station, there are a number of different means uh, of measuring distances. But before we get into um, the techniques, I do want to take a step back and make sure that we're all referencing the, the same terminology. So this lecture is about measuring horizontal distances, okay? And I want to be clear what we're talking about um, is horizontal distances. If I have two points that are affixed on the earth, okay, there are three ways that I could essentially describe the difference between them, okay? And I would argue that of the three, the one that is the least valuable is the slope distance. Um, or, I don't like to use the term actual distance, but maybe I will. Um, the slope distance is probably the one that is of the least value. Okay, And I would say the reason for that is so, um, uh, first off, uh, vertical distance is obviously important for uh, assessing uh, elevations. So, for example, if you're trying to ascertain whether or not a given piece of property is uh, has the potential to flood, that is a function of measuring its vertical distance or its elevation. The slope distance doesn't really matter. Horizontal distance doesn't really matter. It's all about the vertical distances. Is your property in the floodplain? You've already heard, heard that term, the floodplain, before. So basically what you're doing is looking uh, at a flood map and, and taking that and comparing it to the elevation uh, of a given property. Um, and I would say that horizontal distance um, is, is more important than slope distance because slope distances and even vertical distances can change with earthwork, okay? So uh, a good uh, a visceral example of that is how many of you have tangentially been paying attention to the development that's been going on at Tanyard Station? You know what I'm talking about? The, the, the center um, that's off exit 18 in Barbersville. But, Think about what that site looked like three years ago. It was way different, right? There were oodles of earthwork done to flatten out space. Well, I would argue that if you pick two points on the ground, independent of any changes in elevation, the horizontal distance wouldn't change, right? So when you look at maps and uh, property boundaries and, and, and boundaries like the, um, the plan views that we saw, uh, on the, the set of plans in uh, lab one, that those, those plan view distances were horizontal distances. They were not slope distances, okay? So I want to make sure that you have a clear understanding uh, uh, in your head as a difference between 
horizontal distances, vertical distances, and slope distances. And again, I would say rarely will an engineer or surveyor express things solely as slope distances. So even, even if you're you, uh, expressing things in terms of slope distances, there's usually some context, like a, a degree of inclination or um, a, a, a vertical uh, angle or, or something of that nature. And, and those uh, terms and whatnot will become clear uh, as we progress throughout the semester. Okay. So I want to go through some distance measuring methods, um, and I'm going to I, I sort of split this up into part one, part two. Part one would probably be the more quote unquote rough methods, and part two would be the ones that are a little bit more on the, um, the uh, I don't want to say accurate side, but there's a little bit of um, uh, uh, methodology and science to them. Uh, and so the um, one way to measure that distance is, as you said, to estimate it visually, okay, to actually eyeball it. And to say that that's not used, again, it would be untrue. We're, we do eyeball distances uh, uh, to this day. Not for final distance determination, but we do use them. But another is to pace it out, okay? So pacing it out would mean that, okay, let's say I'm trying to measure the distance from here to this trash can, okay? So, you know, an experienced surveyor will have an inherent understanding of the length of their pace. So for me, what I can do is I can say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So like eight paces for me. My pace is a probably a little less than three feet. So let's just call it 2.8 just for the sake of discussion. And so I can take 2.8 times the number of paces and say that's about how far that is away. Okay. Now there are levels of inaccuracy with that, which we'll get into, but you can... But like if you're experienced, you can get about a, hundred, a 1 to 50 or 1 to 100 accuracy on that. Uh, and, and this is a skill that I know that when I was a surveyor, I used quite a bit because, you know, what we would be doing is pulling deeds and pulling uh, property descriptions and trying to locate existing property corners. And I knew that the property corner was about 220 feet that way. So I would pace it out and then that would tell me, okay, it's about here. So I'll break out my metal detector and see if I can find it. If I wasn't able to pace it out, I'd be metal detecting all over the place. I'd be there for, you know, who knows how long, okay? So being able to pace distances out to a reasonable accuracy is a valuable skill uh, for a land surveyor. Um, another is to use an odometer wheel. I have a feeling some of you have seen one of these before. How many of you have seen one of these before? Okay, so not most of you. All right, so essentially what it is, it's, it's a calibrated wheel. Um, that the number of revolutions uh, corresponds to a distance traversed, okay? Um, and you can get pretty accurate with an odometer wheel. Your accuracy um, will tend to de uh, uh, dissipate a bit uh, if you're on rocky terrain or earthy terrain because you've got bumps in the ground, maybe that can change things. Can anybody think of a big old disadvantage um, with an odometer wheel? Slopes. It's a slope distance measurement. Essentially, that's what you're measuring directly is slope distances, right? right? So um, you got to understand the, the, the slope uh, of the earth, and then you end up having to do some, some math in order to uh, assess that out. Okay. Um, I would say that of the low-tech methods, probably the one that is the most accurate is tape, is to actually tape it out. So, uh, essentially using a graduated tape or a tape measure to actually measure the distance. Um, I, I think you can get pretty accurate with taping, um, and, and I will mention a couple of taping corrections in here, but I am not going to get um, uh, too far down the rabbit hole with taping corrections. And, and I, I think that you need to understand taping corrections, but I don't think we need to go too far into it because of our... Um, proclivity to measure distances electronically and things like that, but I am going to mention them. But, um, you know, again, I'd say two main applications are to observe a distance between two points and to lay out a known distance uh, with a given uh, start, uh, uh, starting mark. Now, um, the thing about taping is that, you know, let's say this is the tape that you're going to use. The tape is only so long. It's only, let, let, so the tapes we're going to use in lab today are 100 feet long, and the distance that you're going to measure is longer than 100 feet. So you need to have some sort of means of um, uh, measuring distances that are in excess uh, of uh, 100 feet. 
Uh, and so what we're going to do is a, a, a taping procedure that looks something like this. So what we're going to have to do is tape uh, in given segments. And so the, the ground that we're taping on today, for the most part, is pretty level. I mean, it's the ground, so it's not perfect. So I don't think we're going to have, you know, these very abrupt changes uh, in elevation. But the idea is that if you're trying to do distance measurements, so you can see what um, these folks are doing here in the image. So what they're doing is they're measuring the distance, but they're trying to hold the tape level. So they're using these plumb bobs to actually hang over the break point, right? So what you'll do is you will tape out uh, a given distance, measure that distance out. And what you'll do is that point here, that break point, you'll mark that off with the survey pen and then go around and do it. And so you'll have, and that, that's what we, the, the term breaking tape, that's what we're talking about. So you'll measure that uh, in given increments. Now I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you today, uh, the distance that we're gonna measure is gonna be in excess of 100 feet, but not in excess of 200 feet. So you're not gonna have to do this like five or six times, you're only gonna have to do this once. Um, but the idea is that you are gonna have to, uh, 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 to break that uh, at least once. Now, um, one of the things that is worth mentioning um, uh, about taping is the actual process and the equipment used. So the, um, the tapes that, that we're going to use are, uh, for the most part, tapes that you could find uh, at a Lowe's or, or at Home Depot, um, you know, essentially you know, nylon type of materials. But the material utilized for the tape can have a impact on your measurement as well as corrections, okay? So um, I would say that, that if you're actually, you know, back in the day, if you're actually using tapes for, you know, data recording purposes, that you're usually going to use tapes that are made out of steel, okay? Um, there are other um, uh, tapes made out of what's called N-bar. They're, they're much more expensive. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I would say that your, your standard surveying equipment was probably a steel tape. Um, a question about like why does the material matter, um, I'll, uh, I'll be able to answer that in a little bit when we start talking about corrections. But, but I think for the purposes of your understanding and what we're going to do today in lab is probably what's most important are, are understanding the tape graduations. So the tapes that we're going to use in lab today have two different sides to them. One of them is in feet and inches, and the other is in decimal feet. So just make sure that you're paying attention to what side of the tape that you're reading your distances from. Okay. So um, I, I think, that if I remember correctly, the tapes that we're using, the side that's in feet and inches is uh, white, and the side that's in decimal feet is like a yellowish green, and I think you're going to want to make sure you use the yellowish green side. So just Make sure that, uh, that you're um, uh, paying attention to the appropriate side. Uh, another item that is usually kind of, um, I don't want to say contentious, but you kind of want to make sure you're paying uh, attention to is that if you look at the tape, um, you need to pay attention to what is considered zero. Um, so like for example, on this tape up here, zero is actually the end of the hook, whereas this tape here, zero is, is right there. Um, usually what, what I do is I usually start my measurements at one foot just because I can see the, the line. It's usually a, a little easier to delineate what's um, uh, where the measurements are starting. And so on our lab procedures, we'll, we're going to be doing that. Um, and again, so like I said, the taping procedure, uh, what you're doing is you're essentially starting uh, by what we're calling lining in. So you'll do this in lab today. So what you'll do is you'll start at, let's say, point A and you'll place a, uh, what we're calling a range pole uh, at point B. The range pole is just going to be your, your, your prism pole. But the idea is that you need, if you're measuring and you're measuring you know, in these, um, these increments, you need to make sure that as you're measuring from point A to point B that you're staying in line, that you're staying in line, that you're measuring along the line to the point in question. So you sort of start off by placing a destination uh, a, a target uh, or a range pole at the very end. And then what you'll do is you'll, you'll measure those segments and then the way that you mark that on the ground is you'll have a series of survey pens like this or taping pens. And what you'll do is you'll stick those into the ground where the, um, sorry I keep hitting the button here, you'll stick the uh, 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 taping pens on the ground where the plumb bob is coming into contact, where you plan on breaking the tape so that when you go to your next measurement you can start that there. So those survey pens are there to mark where the, the tape uh, is breaking. And then you're using a plumb bob to hang that over the, the, um, the ground where that tape is going to be bro uh, broke. 
And then uh, um, usually what you'll do is you'll need to have a, if you've got really sloped ground, you'll need some sort of hand level to ensure that the tape um, is being leveled throughout the measurement so that you're actually getting a horizontal measurement uh, and not a slope measurement. Now the thing about taping uh, is that um, because of the nature of the process, you're going to get um, error in your measurements. Now, now some of these can be uh, uh, corrected by proper maintenance of your material. So if you have a tape that uh, you're, you've used over and over again, that tape can get worn out and get stretched. Uh, so as long as you're you know, uh, 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 ensuring proper maintenance, you, you can get around that. Some of them, however, like you can't avoid. Um, as an example, um, one of those is temperature. Okay. So, uh, for example, if we're talking about steel tapes, so steel tapes are manufactured uh, at a given standard temperature. Usually that temperature is around 68 degrees, 70 degrees, something like that. 68 uh, is usually the standard. Um, well, let's say you're taping in the dead of winter. What do you think is the problem with that? Okay. When it gets colder, what happens to the metal tape? What happens to the steel tape? It shrinks, right? And if it's a really warm day, what happens? It expands. So the problem is, is that if you're measuring um, distances on a day that is either hotter or colder than the day that you, um, uh, the hotter or colder than the day that you, um, the, the tape was manufactured, your distances are going to be off, and so you need to perform uh, a temperature correction. Another uh, 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 common uh, correction that you need to account for is sag, right? So if you've ever, I mean, you'll even kind of see this today in lab when you're measuring distances, you'll see that you can pull it like really taut, but there's still going to be a little bit of bow just because you've got a hundred foot of tape that's sagging under its own weight, and that's going to change the, um, the measurement a, a little bit. And so those little bits, those little sources of error, they will start to add up, especially when you're doing something like this and you're breaking the tape and doing these measurements uh, over and over again, because that error can propagate throughout your measurement. Now, some of these you can correct. So one of the um, corrections that I'll just, I'm just throwing this up here just for your um, uh, um, background, just for your, your edification. So to put it clear, I, I was going to do a homework problem on this, I decided not to. So everybody's like, I can, I can breathe a, a sigh of relief. Um, but this is an example of a correction that you could make to account for variations in temperature. Now, I'm curious, how many of you have had Engineering 216? So if some of you had Engineering 216, this formula, while written differently, is actually a, the same formula that you learned in there uh, for thermal expansion and contraction. Um, so if you have a an axially loaded bar, and you take that bar and you heat it up, it will elongate or contract, depending upon if the temperature is heat, that increase or the temperature is decrease. And in mechanics of materials, the way that you compute that is you take your original length and your change in temperature and you multiply it by a coefficient of thermal expansion. So in, uh, in mechanics of deformable bodies, we usually call that alpha. Um, and here, the, the, the textbook is calling it beta. It's the same thing. Um, but this um, coefficient is a material-dependent quality. So the idea is if I have a block of steel and I heat it up 100 degrees, it's going to increase uh, uh, its uh, dimensions at a different rate than if that block was made out of concrete or aluminum or copper or nylon or what have you. So the material that you use for your tape is going to affect the temperature corrections you're going to make because you're going to have different coefficients for those materials. And again, the idea is that that correction will be positive if the tape is hotter than your standardization temperature and it's negative if the tape is colder uh, than your standardization temperature. Does that make sense? So yeah, I'm not going to get too worked up over that. Um, I know some uh, uh, faculty who teach surveying, like they'll do that. Um, I know when I, when I was an undergrad we did that, but I just think nowadays with, with much more um, modern means of measuring distances, I, I think you need to know about it. And I think as engineers, if you needed to do it, it's, it's, they're pretty plug and chuck formulas, but I, I want to sort of spend our time in here focusing on methods that I think you'll be using much more readily. Uh, and so I want to focus on optical methods uh, and electronic methods uh, of distance measurement. That's, that's really more from a background perspective. I want to get into the, um, uh, the, the, the stuff that we're using more, more or not these, uh, these days. Um, and so what I'm talking about with optical methods are things like a range 
sort of like uh, uh, sort of like this. I mentioned range finders, so we talked about that uh, as a means of measuring distances from point A to point B. Um, so uh, you can use those; they're not as accurate, but some of the the similar uh, principles uh, uh, that you'll see with here uh, will also apply to our what we're actually going to use in the lab today, which are our means of measuring distances uh, with an auto level. Um, and so I want to talk about um, uh, auto levels for a second. Uh, auto levels are going to become a, um, a main component of our lab for the next few weeks. Um, we're going to use them today, um, but we're all like today's lab, it, like one of the main purposes of this lab is to get you familiar with both the level and the total station. Um, but we're going to spend most of our first part of the semester using the auto level. Okay, so let's talk about this. So this is an auto level and its main purpose, the main purpose of an auto level is for determining elevation differences. Okay, so the idea is that what, um, what you will do is take this auto level and you will cite a leveling rod. This is a leveling rod. I brought one with me. You're going to use one today. Um, we'll talk about this here in a bit. The idea is that what you can do is inside the auto level, you will you know, view inside the eyepiece, and you'll see inside the eyepiece view, you'll see something that looks like this. So you'll see a crosshair, which if you're just doing raw elevation uh, uh, measurements, you're going to uh, sight you know, the center of that crosshair on the leveling rod. But even for folks that have used a level, um, you know, maybe before taking the class, you might not have paid attention to these lines up and uh, uh, down here. Those are the upper uh, and lower stadia. Okay, and we can use these lines here, this line, and this line in order to measure horizontal distances. And I want to kind of show you how that works. Okay, um, so first off, let's talk about procedure. Okay, in order to uh, utilize one of, uh, an auto level, you need two things. You need a level rod and a rod level. I'm sure you're thinking, really? A level rod and a rod level? Yes, they are two different pieces of equipment for two different purposes. So this is a level rod, okay? Um, first off, it telescopes, so this goes all the way out you know, quite a bit. There's a little button here on the back that will lock it into place, so if you press that, you know, it locks in. This goes all the way up to, I believe, around 16 feet. Yeah, that's about as high as it goes. I'm not telescoping that in here. I'll, you know, hit the, the ceiling and whatnot. Um, but the main thing to point out is, again, the graduations are in tenths of a feet, not in hundredths of a feet. And the graduations are a little hard to get used to, I think, the first time that you see them. So, for example, this is two feet, this is three feet, so you can see 2.1, 2.2, 2.3. But the way these lines are drawn, I think, are a little jarring the first time you see them. Because you see 2.3, this is 2.4, and there's only one, two, three, like four four lines in between. So how do you get tenths from that? That doesn't really make a lot of sense. Well, I'm going to show you that uh, uh, here in a bit. Uh, don't, don't worry, that, that'll become clear here in a second. But the other piece of equipment that you need is a rod level. And so a rod level um, looks like this. It's about this big. Um, basically, it's got a, a chamfered corner here on the side. And you just slap it here. And what it's got, it's got a little bubble here. And the idea is that as you hold this up, this needs to be level, okay? So that, that rod level is just there to ensure that whoever's holding uh, the leveling rod is actually keeping it uh, completely vertical. Okay. Now, um, I'll show you a little technique that you can use uh, in lab. Let me see if I can... Okay. A technique that you can use in lab to ensure that you're uh, taking a proper measurement is what's called rocking the rod. Okay. So if this person here, so let's say this person here is holding the uh, leveling rod and we've got somebody over here running the instrument, running the auto level. One of the things that you can do is you can take the, uh, the leveling rod and actually do this a little bit, okay? And what'll happen is, so let's say it's perfectly plumb. So if it's perfectly plumb, you're gonna take a measurement. What happens if you tilt it back? What happens? The measurement goes up. What happens if you tilt it forward? The measurement goes up. The measurement goes up because of trig. So if you're sighting the, um, the the rod and you see the rod person doing this, what you'll see is the crosshair bouncing up and down. And whenever the crosshair hits the bottom, that's the true measurement because that's the smallest distance that it can be when the rod is perfectly plumb. Does that make sense? 
So if you ever hear, like, we're, we won't really need to do that in class because we'll have the leveling rod or the, the rod level. But if you ever hear the term rocking the rod, that's what that means and that's why. So just food for thought. Okay. Now, how do you read a uh, level rod or a leveling rod? Okay. So, again, I think the tick marks can be a little uh, difficult to perceive the first time that you see them. But, again, uh, it, once you... Once you visualize it, I think it'll be easy. Okay, so what I have here is I have a zoomed-in version uh, of a um, uh, of a, a uh, level rod. So to give you kind of an idea, of what we're doing is let me, let me extend this. So you see here uh, on the screen we have six and seven. So and it says see where it says five foot, five foot, five foot. Okay, so here's the uh, level rod. So this is four feet five feet, this is six feet, okay? So what we're doing is we're zooming in like right here, like right in this region. So this region right here is what's being zoomed in here on the screen. So we're magnifying that pretty big so we can all kind of see what's going on. Make sense? Okay, now, right there, okay. So this measurement right here, okay? See this line here where this sort of points up right there? That point right there, that point, is 5.6 feet exactly, okay? So this point right here is 5.7, okay? Now see these little thicknesses right here? These thi these little, little uh, um, uh, solid lines are exactly a hundredth of a foot thick. So watch this. So this is 5.6, 5.61, 5.62, 5.63, 5.64, 5.65, 5.66, Five point six five. See how it points out, right? So that's halfway in between five point six, five point seven. That point five point six five feet. Five point six six, point six seven, point six eight, point six nine, five point seven. Does that make sense? Okay. So what you can do when reading a leveling rod, you can read it to the thousandth of a foot. Okay. So let me give you an example. I want somebody to help me out. How would you read this height? Okay, so first off, is it going to be, so it's going to be 5 point something, right? Is it 5.6 or 5.7? 5.6, so it's 5.6 something. Okay, so 5.6, 0.61, 0.62, 0.63, 0.64, 0.65, 0.66, 0.67, 0.68, 0.69, 0.70, 0.71, 0.72, 0.73, 0.74, 0.75, 0.76, 0.77, 0.78, 0.79, 0.80, 0.81, 0.82, 0.83, 0.84, 0.85, 0.86, 0.87, 0.88, 0.89, 0.90, 0.91, 0.92, 0.93, 0.94, 0.95, 0.96, 0.97, 0.98, 0.99, 0.10, 0.11, 0.12, 0.13, 0.14, 0.15, 0.16, 0.17, 0.18, 0.19, 0.20, 0.21, 0.22, 0.23, 0.24, 0.25, 0.26, 0.27, 0.28, 0.29, 0.30, 0.31, 0.32, 0.33, 0.34, 0.35, 0.36, 0.37, 0.38, 0.39, 0.40, 0.41, 0.42, 0.43, 0.44, 0.45, 0.46, 0.47, 0.48, 0.49, 0.50, 0.51, 0.52, 0.53, 0.54, 0.55, 0.56, 0.57, 0.58, 0.59, 0.60, 0.61, 0.62, 0.63, 0.64, 0.65, 0.66, 0.67, 0.68, 0.69, 0.70, 0.71, 0.72, 0.73, 0.74, 0.75, 0.76, 0.77, 0.78, 0.79, 0.80, 0.81, 0.82, 0.83, 0.84, 0.85, 0.86, 0.87, 0.88, 0.89, 0.90, 0.91, 0.92, 0.93, 0.94, 0.95, 0.96, 0.97, 0.98, 0.99, 0.100, 0.101, 0.102, 0.103, 0.104, 0.105, 0.106, 0.107, 0.108, 0.109, 0.110, 0.111, 0.112, 0.113, 0.114, 0.115, 0.116, 0.117, 0.118, 0.119, 0.120, 0.121, 0.122, 0.123, 0.124, 0.125, 0.126, 0.127, 0.128, 0.129, 0.130, 0.131, 0.132, 0.133, 0.134, 0.135, 0.136, 0.137, 0.138, 0.139, 0.140, 0.141, 0.142, 0.143, 0.144, 0.145, 0.146, 0.147, 0.148, 0.149, 0.150, 0.151, 0.152, 0.153, 0.154, 0.155, 0.156, 0.157, 0.158, 0.159, 0.160, 0.171, 0.172, 0.173, 0.174, 0.175, 0.176, 0.177, 0.178, 0.179, 0.180, 0.191, 0.192, 0.193, 0.194, 0.195, 0.196, 0.197, 0.198, 0.199, 0.200, 0.201, 0.202, 0.203, 0.204, 0.205, 0.206, 0.207, 0.208, 0.209, 0.210, 0.211, 0.212, 0.213, 0.214, 0.215, 0.216, 0.217, 0.218, 0.219, 0.220, 0.221, 0.222, 0.223, 0.224, 0.225, 0.226, 0.227, 0.228, 0.229, 0.230, 0.231, 0.232, 0.233, 0.234, 0.235, 0.236, 0.237, 0.238, 0.239, 0.240, 0.241, 0.242, 0.243, 0.244, 0.245, 0.246, 0.247, 0.248, 0.249, 0.250, 0.251, 0.252, 0.253, 0.254, 0.255, 0.256, 0.257, 0.258, 0.259, 0.260, 0.271, 0.272, 0.273, 0.274, 0.275, 0.276, 0.277, 0.278, 0.289, 0.290, 0.291, 0.292, 0.293, 0.294, 0.295, 0.296, 0.297, 0.298, 0.299, 0.300, 0.301, 0.302, 0.303, 0.304, 0.305, 0.306, 0.307, 0.308, 0.309, 0.310, 0.311, 0.312, 0.313, 0.314, 0.315, 0.316, 0.317, 0.318, 0.319, 0.320, 0.321, 0.322, 0.323, 0.324, 0.325, 0.326, 0.327, 0.328, 0.329, 0.330, 0.331, 0.332, 0.333, 0.334, 0.335, 0.336, 0.337, 0.338, 0.339, 0.440, 0.441, 0.442, 0.443, 0.444, 0.445, 0.446, 0.447, 0.448, 0.449, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.454, 0.455, 0.456, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.454, 0.455, 0.456, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.454, 0.455, 0.456, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.454, 0.455, 0.456, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.454, 0.455, 0.456, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.455, 0.456, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.451, 0.452, 0.453, 0.457, 0.458, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.459, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 0.450, 
Yeah, I'm sure even to those of you that have used a level before, you have probably, you know, very easily can see this, but you might have ignored these. What's going on with these? These are Stadia, okay? And so let me explain how Stadia work, okay? So whenever you are using an auto level, those Stadia are calibrated to a very specific reading. And that reading is usually such, it's usually a ratio of 1 to 100. So the idea is that if you're siding uh, a leveling rod, that the difference between those uh, stadia readings, that every one foot in difference between those stadia readings corresponds to a hundred foot in horizontal distance. So let me show you what's going on. So let's say I've got a, a leveling rod here, and this one's like way high. So I'm, you know, uh, this one, this one's way high up here. Okay, so let's consider this example. So the actual elevation reading is 14 something, right? Okay, but I want to look at the upper and lower stadia. So this upper stadia right here is pretty much right at, let's say, 15 feet. Okay, now the lower stadia, let's call this, we'll say it's 13 point, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, let's call that 13.45. We're just going to the hundreds place just to keep this simple. So this upper stadia is at 15 feet. This lower stadia is at 13.45. So the difference between the stadia readings is 1.55 feet. Take that, multiply it by 100, and that is the measurement from the instrument to how far away the rod is. Okay, does that make sense? So that is a way that we can measure distances by using that upper and lower stadia. And we are going to do that in this class when we do differential leveling. As I mentioned, um, one of the um, labs that we're going to do is a differential level, and those labs we're going to get data that doesn't close and we're going to need to correct that. One of the ways that we're going to correct that is to use those stadia readings. So, um, again, we'll get there, but I just want to make sure that that, that's, that point is made that we are going to use that uh, a little later. Okay. Um, the other um, distance measuring device, or the other um, tool that I would mention uh, that is, that is uh, worth mentioning regarding measuring distances is to use electronic distance measuring, uh, me uh, measurements, or EDM. And the most common, commonplace, ubiquitous device uh, in land surveying to measure distances is what's called a total station, okay? This is an image of a total station. You all are gonna use one today and tomorrow in lab. Uh, but a total station is, I mean, I would say that, that it was one of the really game-changing devices uh, in the field of land surveying. Um, it was, you know, since it was introduced, it changed things, and I don't, it's not going away anytime soon. Um, but a, a total, the, one of the reasons they call it a total station is because it can do everything all at once. So we used to have levels for measuring vertical distances. We used to have theodolites for measuring angles. Well, a total station can do everything. It can measure horizontal distances. It can measure vertical distances. It can measure slope distances, it can measure horizontal angles, it can measure vertical angles, it can measure it all, okay? Now, typically, what you need is a, um, a, a, a total station, and then you need an accompanying device uh, called a prism, okay? So a prism pole, you'll see that, you're going to use one today, it's this telescoping pole that has this prism-looking thing on it, and the idea is that what you'll do is you'll sight this in, you'll essentially just sort of like hit a button, okay? And what the um, device will do is it will shoot essentially a laser um, to that prism and it will reflect it back. A, um, a total station in a way is just a really super fancy hyper accurate clock. Because what it will do is it will measure the time from the, the laser being shot and reflected back and it will, it will do that multiple times. Like when you hit the button, it's doing it over and over again, and it will report to you an average. And that, um, that error that a, um, that a total station contains is very small and very manageable. I mean, we're talking like five parts per million uh, in the measurement. And so, you know, again, in terms of its capabilities, it's really, really, um, really, really powerful. Um, most total stations, uh, I would say, like, you, uh, you know, typically you're using a total station with a prism. Some total stations nowadays can take readings without the prism. You, know, you can actually, you know, take a, um, a total station, point it to, let's say, the corner of a building and shoot it, and it will actually reflect off of the building. There's probably a little bit of uh, accuracy loss that you get with that, but um, it's, uh, 
uh, it, it's a pretty handy feature on, on a lot of our devices. Um, so just to be clear, um, with all of these uh, devices, even with total stations, um, there are errors that we cannot avoid. So for example, if we're talking about uh, auto levels and using Stadia, what are some of the errors? And, and some of these you're going to see today. Um, so for example, one of the principles in setting up an auto level is that the device itself has to be level. Okay? And if your device is not level, that's going to cause an error in your measurement. Um, today, what we're going to do is we're going to set the auto level up over a specific point. What if it's not 100% over that point? That's going to cause an error. Um, what if you didn't place the rod directly over the nail in question? That's going to be a problem. And when I say nail, what I'm saying is we're going to be measuring the distance between two nails that are set out in front of uh, Morrow and Science. And so each group is going to have, a, like, there's there's... A set of seven or seven sets of nails. So there's like an orange set, a blue set, a green set, and everybody's gonna. Each group is gonna have their own nail set that they're gonna measure distances from. Um, maybe the rod's not a held level. Maybe you're just making an incorrect reading, or maybe like you and I are looking at the same distances and just coming up with a different reading. Um, what about the total station? Maybe the station's not level. Maybe the station's not centered over the nail. Maybe the prism's not over the, the nail. Maybe the prism pole. Uh, is not level. Um, all of those uh, components can contribute uh, to error. Okay, so uh, I just want that to be clear that we're gonna um, like even with these um, these advanced techniques, uh, even with electronic distance measurement, there are errors that we can't avoid. Okay, I want to take a, a a break for a second. See if anybody has any questions. All right. So here's what's going to happen. So we're going to start lab right at two. Um, uh, here's what we're going to do from a housekeeping standpoint today. So we're, you know, class is going to end a little early, so y'all have a little bit of a break. We are going to meet at 22, for, for last today, we're going to meet in 2241 at 2 p.m. We're going to go through a couple things, some safety guidelines, um, some lab procedures. Um, I mean, we had lab last week, but this is the first time that we're, like, really having lab. Because we're going out, we're actually surveying. Um, so hopefully everybody that's in lab today brought closed toe shoes um, and all that. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm gonna, I would say that normally I would suggest sunscreen, but I don't really think that's needed or not as necessary today because it's kind of overcast. Uh, but I mean, like if we're out there for a long time, I don't want anybody to get uh, uh, get a sunburn or anything. But I will see you all at two o'clock, and we will have some fun outside. All right. Yes. Yeah,